Hi, welcome to another installment of Ron Roots Presents on Disc Jockey News TV. I'm uh, so excited to uh, be interviewing one of my very special friends, and he's actually my mentor with the National Speakers Association. He's the, uh, the, the chapter president of the Kansas City chapter of the National Speakers Association, and his name is Steve Irison. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Steve, because Steve's got a huge bio, so I'm going to have to like refer to my notes, because he's there's so much to tell. He's known, Steve Irison's influence as a speaker and writer in the field of leadership has been far-reaching. His ideas and approach to creating a leadership culture and navigating le leadership challenges have helped leaders within corporations, associations, government, and even the military. He is the founder and owner of Aurora Point, a leadership development and training company. And he's also the author of, get ready to write these down because there's a ton of books. He is the author of The Porcupine Principles, Personality Jazz, Creating Harmony at Work. Let me try that again. He is the author of The Porcupine Principle. That's one book. Personal personality jazz, creating harmony at work, and unplugged mindfulness and the law, which he co-authored with Joel Oster, or is it Oster? No, it's Oster. It is Oster. Okay, good. Well, yeah. see, even without rehearsal, I got it right. He was also a <laughs> contributor to a management webinar series that featured his programs, developing a success mindset and overcoming barriers to execution. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm great. I'm so glad to be with you, Ron. Did I cover your entire life in that in your intro there? I just Pretty close. Sure I got yeah. it all. Is there anything I missed? I mean, you know, they say that your life flashes right before you, just moments before. No, an we'll interview. Go <laughs> <laughs> an interview is right. <laughs> just moments before an interview, my life just flashed before me. Yes. So I want to I want to start with uh, in your afterward. We're going to talk about this book in your afterward. Uh, it, you say P Pamplona, Pamplona, Spain has the running of the bulls. France has the Tour de France. Indianapolis has the Indy 500, and Council Idaho hosts the World Champion Porcupine races. And I'm guessing that this is the basis of what's called the Porcupine Principle. But let's start with let's start with the <laughs> basics. I want to know. Tell me about the World Championship Porcupine Races. What is that all about? Uh, what you haven't heard of it before? I, I thought I, it was it was a world renowned event. Really, I must be living under a rock because I somehow <laughs> missed it. Unless they do it at Disney World, I don't see it. So, oh well, maybe we could arrange a a, a Disney style. There you uh, go. Ring. Yeah, that's right. Well, Council Idaho is a little tiny town, tucked up in the mountains of Idaho, about uh, two and out. Well, maybe two hour drive north of Boise, Idaho. Right. And it used to be years ago a lumber town. Uh, a forest service town. If you uh, if you were employed, that was pretty much going to be one of your choices, the lumber companies, logging industry, right. and all that. And years and years ago, there's a, two or three gentlemen who were part of the Chamber of Commerce who were talking with each other over coffee about the need to do something interesting and fun to get people to come to the community, uh, maybe, uh, maybe have a little bit of a charity event, you know, whatever it was, and one of them came up with this idea of having a porcupine race. And the other two said, sure, why not? Because there's <laughs> plenty of porcupines all over in, in the mountains of Idaho, and that was the, the impetus of this crazy idea. And now 40-plus years later, every 4th of July, they host the World Championship Porcupine Races. But, okay, 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 all right. First off, I love the fact that two other guys went – why not? But but my bigger question is about porcupines. I mean, don't these things like aren't they dangerous or don't they like have these real stickly pointy quills on them that can like sure do. shoot out at you and yeah, put yeah. your eye out? Well, I'm not sure they put your eye out, but uh, they if you make contact with them, you're going to get hurt. You 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 sure will. Um, uh, the porcupines. Uh, and I'm not a porcupine expert, but I've had to learn some things about them in order to teach what I teach. Porcupines are the uh, largest of the rodent family in North America. Right. And they do have quills. The quills have a sharp barb at the end of every one, kind of like a fish hook. Right. If it punctures your flesh, um, it's going to stick. 
and it's going to stay. And it, and at that point, it, it pulls away from the porcupine. And while a predator is dealing with its pain, the porcupine gets to wander off. Right. Yeah. Now, at the races, what's interesting is that your goal is to get your porcupine to the finish line before anybody else can. Your problem is not the quills. Your problem is that porcupines don't run in straight lines. So you have to find a way to persuade them to get to a goal line. And uh, sometimes um, they need a little extra, uh, a le- little extra influence. So I'll say it that way to make it happen. So you just can't point and go, you need to go that way. No, you can't be a motivational speaker or an inspi- inspiring mo- uh, leader <laughs> of some sort. Here's our goal. Let's make it happen. They're going to uh, usually uh, just sit there and look at you. Um, it, it, what's interesting is that the racists, uh, they have tools that they use. They have a broom. Right. They have a trash can, okay. and they, they bring the, the porcupines to the starting line in the trash cans and then turn the cans upside down so that the porcupines are underneath the cans. And as soon as the race begins, they lift those cans up, and at that moment, you've got to try to figure out how to get that porcupine to move in the direction that you prefer. So, so there's, there's a broom, and there's a yes. trash can, and those are your only two tools that you can use to convince them to go in the direction that you want them to go. Did that? Did did I get that right? Well, yeah, pretty much. But there is another element that I um, I think maybe we'll cover a little bit in okay. our conversation. Right. And that's yeah, I don't the, want I don't want it spoiler alerts here. Let's, let's, well, yeah, but we'll we'll give a little bit of a way. Uh, there is a there is a fence. Now, when I was a little, little boy, people asked me, "How did you ever discover the porcupine races?" Uh, I was a little boy, and my dad was the pastor of the church in this little mountain town. And when I was small, that was the beginning of the races. I I got to witness some of the very first races ever. And in those days, they didn't have a fence. The crowd that would gather around the field where they hosted these, uh, they were supposed to be the barriers. Uh, But do you you know what people do when rogue porcupines start to run straight out? I would run the other way. Yeah, they they scatter. My dad would say, well, that was a biblical moment. They parted just like the Red Sea, and now you're chasing the porcupine down Main Street. <laughs> so, oh my goodness! Uh, after a couple of years, they figured, uh, you know, we need something a little bit more dependable. So they uh, they put up a fence, and uh, that that can become a good tool for you as well. Okay, I want to get into the book. We're going to get into the book here in a minute, but I got I I got at least a couple more questions on this whole porcupine race thing because now I'm fascinated. So. Okay, so do they do they have like like farms where they raise these porcupines? <laughs> be racer, no. and, and you no. go to the farm and you pick out one and you race it. How does no. how do, where do these porcupines come from? Most of the porcupines are caught somewhere in the in the region. They're either caught in the forest along the lo- old logging roads. Uh, oftentimes, they find them in the farmer's fields or maybe in the hay uh, in the barns. Uh, you never know where you're going to find them. Uh, they are nocturnal. And so the teams that have to, that want to race, they have to catch their own. So they're wild. Um, you should catch them at night. And for those of you who are thinking, well, you know, this, this doesn't seem too fair for the porcupine. Uh, the competitors have to participate in a class that's taught by the wildlife department. There's, there's some very strict rules on how the animals are to be treated. And they are typically caught 24 to 48 hours before the race. Uh, it's my understanding now that uh, wherever that porcupine is found, you have to GPS that location because when the race is over, yep. you have to return the porcupine exactly where you found it that afternoon. <laughs> and, um, and every animal is examined by a veterinarian before the race begins. And if there's uh, any indication of an injury, uh, if the porcupine is pregnant, don't ask me how they figure that out. I don't know <laughs> how. Uh, but if it is, they don't race those porcupines. <laughs> I, that's just that's just fascinating to me. I mean, well, at least at least, and, and I would imagine the porcupines are really well taken care of while in a handler's care. I mean, they probably get fed only the best, whatever it is, yes. porcupine food. I mean, I, I I don't think I've ever seen porcupine food on the on the shelf at PetSmart, but I'm guessing there's got to be some kind of a uh, formula that goes along with it. So let's talk a little bit about how all of this applies to the book. So. You obviously uh, found some kind of life lesson from this mm. porcupine racing that applies to everyday life and the business and just um, to family. I, tell me a little bit, what, what, what inspired you to write this book? 
<laughs> well, for a number of years in my leadership experiences, I, 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 and I'm sure none of your uh, viewers and listeners have ever had these problems, but I, I discovered there were some grumpy, uh, uncooperative, reluctant people that I would have to find ways to, uh, to lead and to, to engage in some right. way. Uh, some of them were very um, uh, obstinate and others just, you know, not comfortable with change. And so I, I learned through experience different methodology that worked for my personality and style, uh, none of which really came from the porcupine races. It was just stuff right. that I needed to do. Uh, when I started the leadership development company, I was doing leadership training, uh, typically one and two day training programs. Mm -hmm. And a part of that would always be, how do you handle conflict? Uh, we had a specific curriculum that we had to use while we were going through those programs, specifically when we did programs for military and government, they had very, mm -hmm. uh, very strict curriculum we had to work through. And to be quite honest, it was boring. Uh, content was okay, but it was just boring. And I, I noticed after a number of months of teaching these courses that every time we get to this particular section, even though people wanted to figure out how to deal with conflict, the curriculum itself, just they, they just disconnected from it. And one day out of desperation, uh, not just for the participants, but for myself, because I was bored too, right. I I had this crazy memory of the porcupine races. And I said, you know, this point right here in the curriculum kind of reminds me of a time when I saw the porcupine races. And everybody in the room went, what? And they leaned in and they're going, what's well, a porcupine race? And so I started to talk about how the races occurred and how I thought that this concept and this method of persuasion was very similar to the way they tried to persuade porcupines to cooperate to reach a goal Right. that they didn't really want to reach in the first place. And everybody in the room lit up. And one guy said, oh, man, I've got a prickly person on my team. And that was, for me, the light bulb. Everybody's got a prickly person. And so I went back and I just started to look at my memories. I started taking notes. I found photos. Um, I started to think through, well, could I begin to teach this using the metaphor of the races a little bit more um, uh, entertaining? Uh, but also memorable with some key ideas. And that was that was really the beginning of the teaching. And after about five or six years of, of teaching that right. and actually becoming known for that particular program, I decided it was time to write the book. And therefore, the porcupine principles became, um, became kind of the, the core of everything we teach. And I teach five specific principles about leadership using the story and the experience of the races. What I found fascinating about your book, um, and yes, I did read it. Uh, what I found fascinating about your book was that um, it doesn't just apply to people uh, with with coworkers or with people, employees, I guess, or staff members. It, in my opinion, it applies to uh, persuasion in in just about everything anybody does, whether it be in sales consultations or whether it be in um, uh, planning meetings or whether it has to do with um, a family. Uh, it's it's all about persuasion. Yeah. And I know the the four the four examples that you use in the book. Um, of of the different personalities that can sometimes be prickly people are the pessimist, where nothing is ever right and everything is always wrong, doesn't matter. Uh, the agitator, uh, this is an individual that really knows how to do their job well, but for some reason seems to have real problems communicating with people within the organization. Outside the organization, inside the organization, not so much. Right. Right. Uh, and then there's what I call the bipolar, um, or literally would be more more literally would probably be passive aggressive. This is a person that in front of you is going, Steve, you are the most amazing employer I have ever met. I I I got to I hope I retire with this company. But the minute they walk out the door, uh, they're telling others how you not so much either. Right. Uh, and then there's the constant complainer. Uh, this is an individual that doesn't just complain for the sake of complaining. This is usually an individual that lacks confidence and maybe even social skills. And I, you know, I think we all have run into into people like that. Um, yeah. One of my one of my one one of the things you talk about in your book that I really um, 
liked was how most people, how all of this starts with an understanding that most people, their basic needs are respect, feeling value, and having some autonomy. Um, mm -hmm. So let's talk about that, how, it, how that relates to the porcupine races. Um, one of the very, very first principles you talk about is the broom. We talk, you tell, talk a little bit more about how the broom is used in relationship to the porcupine races and how that, that applies to uh, helping with uh, not control these individuals, but being able to better uh, communicate with these individuals. Okay. That would be a better choice of words. Yeah. Uh, well, I, maybe it would be good for me to just give this disclaimer or this strong advice. Okay. That I am not in any way advocating that you begin to chase people around with a broom and a trash can. <laughs> Even though it, it might be tempting to do so. Well, now I got to um, change the headline. Just of the video. Of the metaphor. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but the idea of the broom, if we think about the race, uh, okay. Uh, during the race, when the race begins, the champions that tend to be more uh, consistently successful right. have a methodology, strategy of how to use the broom. And the broom, right. uh, we might think, is to protect yourself from getting stuck, but what they see is it's a tool to persuade. Right. And what they do is if the, if the porcupine begins to move maybe a, a little too far to the left or the right, they will put the broom in front of its nose. And all of a sudden it realizes there's something in its way. And then it will begin to make an adjustment. It will shift. They're not allowed to push, poke, or prod. Right. They can't they, touch the they can, right. They can persuade it. Right. right. And so watching that, I began to realize that's the, that's the tool that represents our, our need to be a little bit more engaging and help people have better information. Um, it, it's not just a leadership thing. It, it applies to sales. It right. applies to... Uh, teamwork, like you said, it, it can even work within family context. And here's the principle that I, I, that I wrote in regards to the broom. The, the broom's about guidance, which is really persuasion. And the principle itself is that the best decisions, the best decisions uh, come from timely, uh, meaningful information right. and, some, and a clarity of direction. Now, the key words out of that principle for me is decisions and timely, meaningful information. Uh, the reason that decisions is a key word is because it's a decision that the other person is needing to make. Right. Now, the races, they inform the porcupine, not an option, not going to go this direction, and it, it makes its own, uh, own decision. It, it, it makes an adjustment mm -hmm. on its own, preferably where you want it to go. If it goes too far, then... Broom comes over here, and you inform it, and now you can guide it. Right. Um, and I think if we see people as people that need to be respected, mm -hmm. and we value them, and that key word of autonomy, a basic need, that people have a need to control their own engagement, their own process. Um, and none of us like to be controlled, and if we do, we get prickly. Uh, but if we have the room to be informed and to make choices as we experience all of that, right. then we're going to be more engaged in the process. And so that's an important element. The other pieces are timely, meaningful information. You know, the porcupine racers don't just put the broom down when they feel like it. They put the broom down as it's needed during the course of the race because you never know when something's going to happen. They've got to be ready to, to adjust to that. And I think a lot of leaders – uh, a lot of salespeople, they're right. so focused on reaching the goal that they're not paying attention and they're not listening to the fact that some people are just needing more info. Right. And they, and they need information that's relevant to their need. And if we, will, if we would really pay attention to that, then we could then respond more appropriately. And as people gain that information, the, the more information they gain, the better qualified they are to move forward. Right. And I think a couple lessons that might apply to the people that are, that are watching the video. One is that, um, you know, in our industry, in the wedding and event industry, we're often dealing with people that are not, that don't work for us. They work, uh, they work, they, they, they represent another segment of the industry, like a wedding planner and a DJ as an example. And oftentimes there may be a miscommunication between the wedding planner and the DJ, but it's not a matter of whether the wedding planner is, uh, not willing to bend 
uh, but it's maybe a matter of they just need more information of why why it is as a DJ, I need to be able to perform this particular function of my job. Without that information, then yeah, they're, they're, they're just think that, they may think that all you're trying to do is take control, whereas this is a situation where we could actually help each other here. Let me explain how we can help each other here, mm-hmm. how we can right. not only help each other, but how we can, be, uh, we can have even a better result for this particular event. Another example, uh, and you use it in your book, which, by the way, I, I, this, this one really stood out to me. Uh, uh, you talk about how a uh, picture a sales rep that walks into your office and they, they, they want you to buy a $20,000 copier um, and, and they, they just, you know, and they hand you a contract. Here, this is a $20,000 copier. It's going to do a better job. Here's a contract. Sign it. Would you sign it? Chances are. No, and why? It's because there's not been any information here that persuades you, to, that, that tells you you really need to have this. Yes, it may be better, but what else? I mean, what does it do? And a lot of times in a sales consultation, um, I think sales reps have a tendency to, to want to talk about the what, but mm-hmm. very few want to talk about the why. Why is this important to you? How is this going to be a benefit to you? Mm-hmm. And if you, can, if you can get people to understand that, if you can persuade people to understand the why, they're going to be more inclined to sign on the bottom line. Am I reading this right? Am I? I think so, yeah. Uh, and, and let me add a little to that as well. Okay. Uh, oftentimes what I hear salespeople do is they talk about the what it will do. Right. And, and what they want to accomplish, but what they haven't done is taken time to find out what is the need and desire right. of the potential customer. And if we can figure out what is it that's important to them, then tie that to the why this is a potential answer or a a process that works for you. And you're going to get this kind of result. And the thing, go back to uh, working with that meeting planner. Um, You're a team. You, uh, your partners, it's like being in the porcupine races. There's two human beings and one prickly partner and together they've got to work. And I'm thinking, I've never thought about weddings being quite like porcupine races, but maybe they are (laughs) where you have meeting planners who have their own idea of how to get there. And you've got another partner who is supposed to help bring the energy and the engagement and keep things flowing. So you've got one who's working on this the strategy of all the pieces, but you've got one who's executing, um, and, and and for lack of uh, term, uh, you're kind of the MC of right. this whole experience, helping to deliver what the meeting planner wants anyway. Uh, but sometimes they don't get your language because they only think in terms of their checklist, and you're looking at not just the checklist, but the big picture of other pieces that need to happen. So finding a way to really communicate and having that better information uh, is should be a win-win. And it actually, and it's information that should be just like probably with the the porcupine races, there's gotta be, there's gotta be some discussion of strategy before you ever show up at the races. It doesn't just happen when you, when you get on the starting line, there has to be some conversation between the two people about how, how are we going to make this work? How are we going to, how are we going to be the champions today? A lot of times in, in my industry, in the wedding and event industry, a lot of times these conversations don't take place until the actual event. And by that time, everybody's locked in on what they're doing and there's not going to, it's definitely not going to be as easy to not persuade to anybody to change their mind. Whereas if the conversation takes advance, uh, takes place in advance and there yeah. is a clear line of communication, then yes, that's going to be, it, that's going to make it easier when you actually get to the event and probably going to be accepted by the time that you get to the event as well. well Ron, uh, I witnessed the races again this summer. We uh, flew back to Idaho and got to see what was going on. And I shadowed a a television crew that had heard about the races and they came to interview some of the contestants. And there was one team that the, uh, the interviewer asked, so what's your strategy? And these two young guys looked at each other and kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, "Um, let it go and see what happens. (laughs) Did they win? And no, they, they ended up running in circles at the starting line and never really got anywhere down the field. And the other team that actually placed it and was, uh, I'm not sure that they won. Uh, they were really close to winning, but they responded by saying, oh yes, we've talked about who's doing what and what we hope will happen. 
of course, you never know because it's a porcupine, but we've got a plan and it's our secret. We're not going to tell anybody. Right. Yeah. I mean, but because they had planned in advance, they, they were better prepared. Absolutely. I mean, if you, how does that, there's an expression about something about planning the work. I, but yes, if you plan ahead, yes. then things are going to be more likely to go in the, in the way you want them to go. So let's, uh, so the, the first principle then is of the principle of the broom and the best way to break that down. And I'm, I'm quoting from your book is the best decisions come from timely, meaningful information and clarity of direction. So the, the second principle has to do with what? The trash can. When things don't go well, um, you've got to have a plan to contain things. And sometimes, the, for me personally, uh, I need to be prepared to contain my own drive and right. passion to accomplish the goal and the timeline that I have in mind. And when others kind of drag their feet or they don't miss, they misunderstand or whatever the issues may be, um, I, I can get impatient and I can push forward when in reality, maybe I am needing to slow down, uh, take a little time to be a little more courteous, keeping in mind uh, the, the principle of respect and uh, giving them opportunity to really think through how they can be successful in that. And so the containment is, it, it really is, it comes down to thoughtful conversations. So I really do does, believe I'm sorry. thoughtful conversations will lead to much greater uh, possibility and potential. And if we aren't thoughtful, what we end up having is thoughtless confrontations, which do no good at all. So how does, how does a trash can, though, apply to, uh, and I want to get more into what you were just talking about, but how does it apply to the races? So they put the porcupine in a, in a trash can. Yes. And I'm assuming, is it, is it a kind of trash can that has a lid on it, or is it just in the bottom of a... a it's just a, yeah, it's an open, open can, so okay. probably a 50-gallon uh, trash can, like a, a big Rubbermaid kind of okay. can or something right. like that. So they flip it and, over, um, so it's upside down, and the porcupine, right. of course, is inside of this trash can. That's and right. The, and so when the, kind of like a starting line gate, when they say go, you lift up the trash can and the porcupine goes. Right. But, but so... But the but but does it serve any other purpose in the race? Other, yeah, kind of like the broom. I mean, okay, so you got the broom to kind of help with the direction. Is the is the trash can just simply for the purpose of yeah. ready set go? No, there's more to it. The I I interviewed two young men a few years ago who have won six times over the course of nine years. <laughs> That's dead. I noticed. I noticed they had some techniques that nobody else did, and I'm thinking six times out of nine is a pretty good success rate. So. <laughs> I asked them about the trash can and they said, well, Stephen, oftentimes most people just use the trash can as a way to uh, protect themselves from getting stuck. Right. And uh, the defense thing. Right. They use it. They use it offensively. Um, th their, their intention is to, um, well, what they do is they lay the can down on its side okay. right behind the porcupine so that if in the middle of the race it decides, you know, I don't want to go this way and it turns around and tries to retreat, it discovers um, that's not an option. <laughs> there's, there's this visual, it's like, oh, okay. It's almost like a mobile boundary in a right. sense. And some teams will use it, uh, they, they pound it on the ground to try to create some sound, maybe thinking that will move it forward. Uh, I don't believe that. Uh, that that's necessarily the best thing. I don't think it really works. Um, but what they told me was that when they put the broom and the trash can together and it, whatever the porcupine does, each one is prepared to do what they need to do to keep things moving in the right direction. And so right. that whole idea of the can is just to, it really is, it's about preventing a retreat. Now bring that to conversations. Right. If we engage people early on with a strategic process, and in the middle of the race, we are communicating more frequently and, and trusting each other's input at any given point. We're going to be able to keep moving ahead instead of just stopping and getting no results at all. Yeah, and I, and I really like that. Actually, you, you talked about how the, this trash can represents containment and not containment in the sense of you want to try to separate somebody from something. The containment mm -hmm. is, is you want to give, them, give people an opportunity to think about things before. Right. In other words, if I'm offering you an idea, 
I, I, I want to give you an opportunity to consider that idea so, right. to, so, so that you don't feel pressed to follow through at that moment, especially if it's something that you're not really excited about. If, especially if it's a, in, a, in a workplace, it may be a change in a policy or procedure that's going to change everything in the way you've ever done anything before. And it also it gives you an opportunity as an employer or as, as the conversation starter, regardless of what the conversation relationship is, you have an opportunity to, to listen. This is an opportunity to just stop and listen, which is something we don't do a whole lot of right. as human. We, uh, I, I can't, I, I'm trying to remember who said it, but th there's a great quote about we often listen uh, only to respond rather than really understand a person's need. Right. And, and right. uh, I think, you know, that, that's a great, I, I like the containment part of that as a great analogy or a metaphor for just taking a moment. In, and Because in the book, you talk about how if the, if the porcupine is going like really crazy and trying to burrow its way out underneath the fence, I'll take the can and just put it over just to kind of say, let's take a moment. Yeah. Let's think yeah. about this a little bit. I don't know whether the porcupine's yeah. really thinking about it or <laughs> no, probably not. But but I think the the point is for most of us is that uh, we we are so passionate about what we do, right? And we're so good at what we do. We Absolutely. know what works. Uh, but others haven't had the experience. They they don't know what's really what we what we might be able to help them with. And so it's important to give an idea suggest an idea, but then give them the courtesy of contemplation, giving them the time to just process it and think about it and to see, oh, there might be real value in that. And uh, the idea of, of um, regrouping and, and getting a chance to just let everybody maybe take a breather, <laughs> take a short break, and then let come back and let's, let's, let's start again and making sure that we know where we're going uh, can be a, a great help and avoid right. lots of confrontation later. Uh, but just, you know, and I, I won't name any names, but I have, I have some people in my life who are very close to me that I know if I suggest an idea and I push for that idea right now, uh, they will oppose it. But if I suggest the idea very casually in a conversation and I leave it alone for a day or two or maybe a week or two, most likely they come back and say, you know, I've been thinking about something and I, th I think we should, and they offer my idea as if it was their own. <laughs> so you're planning and, an idea. And, and I get it. no credit for it. But, you know, sometimes we just have to understand the relationships. Right. Some people need a little more time to embrace it, to think about it, and eventually they love it enough that they will – they will say, hey, why don't we do this? And I've also learned that it's important to say, well, I told you that. As long as they're going in the right direction, right. why do we care if we get the credit or not? Because the outcome is what we all want to share anyway. That, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I can't tell you how much it annoys. Yeah. I, <laughs> you know, when you work in an ego-driven industry, it, that's usually the first thing that happens. It happens a lot. I shouldn't say the first thing that happens. That's unfair. That, but that happens a lot. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And it's rather than making it, look at what we did, look at what I did. Uh, right. Quoting from your book again, just to kind of wrap up this section, I, I love this. It says, um, again, give people the courtesy of some time for contemplation. None of us feel uh, like to feel caught off guard. And the courtesy you give in these situations is a wonderful way to build trust, and mm -hmm. it helps you discover people's concerns, ideas, and misunderstandings. It's like when somebody comes to, again, in my industry, to make it relatable to DJs, when people come to you, they may think that all you do is play music, it, but in fact, you do a whole lot more. If, you're, if you're, you're offering up ideas and then allowing them to, to absorb what you're talking about rather than... Uh, just saying, oh, no, that's not what I do. I do this. But if you're, if you're sharing stories, if you're sharing information with them on how this is going to benefit you again and giving them an opportunity to absorb all this, it will be, it will be more helpful to you. All right. So uh, it's better to manage the conversations, not the confrontations. I love that as well. Yes. All right. So that, that uh, we'll wrap this section up with the principle of the trash can is thoughtful conversations can help to achieve positive solutions 
thoughtless confrontations will leave you running in circles. I put that on my Facebook page yesterday because I think that <laughs> that is an awesome, awesome quote. Thoughtful conversations can help to achieve positive solutions. Thoughtful, th thoughtless confrontations, just wanting to pick a fight, will leave you just running in circles because nobody's going to listen to you at that point. All right, so let's move on to the third principle, which has to do with the fence. Yes, yes. So the fence, you were talking earlier about how uh, it used to be people were the fence. And, right. of course, when the porcupine ran towards the people, the people would all scatter. It's like, no. And That's they would right. run, uh, kind of like in a sci-fi movie. I see it like the big <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, but then they, then they built just a, they put up, uh, is it a permanent fence? Is it something that goes up every year, comes down? How does yeah, that? Yeah, they, the, they build the fence, uh, the day before the race. Okay. And is it a chain link or is it like one of those orange, uh, safety type fences? The, it's, it's, it's an orange safety fence. Okay, it's okay. usually a solid color. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, they, they outline the course, uh, the, the day before and, um, what, what the champions have told me is that they finally, they figured out that the fence was actually their best tool. Right. Uh, because trying to get a porcupine to run in a straight line to the goal, not going to happen. But if you could, if you could move the porcupine quickly to the fence, right. The fence is not something that you want to avoid. It actually can be a tool to help you gain <laughs> progress. <laughs> and what they what they figured out is, you know, once the porcupine gets to the fence, it sees an, an unmovable standard. Uh, there's a trash can behind it keeping it from retreat, and there's a broom giving it daily or, uh, you know, timely information, and it looks down the fence line and sees no obstacles. And what's it going to do? It's right. going to move in that direction because that's what it wants. And what I began to realize with leadership and, and interaction with customers and uh, it, it, every aspect of life is that the better defined our boundaries, the better our results. Absolutely. If we're clear in advance – what we will and won't do. If uh, you as a DJ are clear about what you're contributing, what you will do, right. and what's not your place to do, what a meeting planner understands, these are my roles and responsibilities. Having that understanding, then when it's game time, uh, you can function better because you're depending on each other, but you've got, you've got real clarity as to what we will and won't do. Uh, in contracts, for example, I, I am uh, in, in certain contracts, uh, certain things that I, I will be doing for them. And there are some things that we define that we will not do. Right. And because we've agreed and understood them in advance, when it's time for some things to happen, um, once in a while, I'll, I'll just need to remind them, uh, based on our agreement, uh, this is what I will do. And uh, this is not something we're going to to, to, to do at this event. Right. And uh, when you bring that up, they go, oh, yeah, I forgot. And what I think is really fascinating about boundaries is that when people know what the boundaries are, the rules, if you want to call them that, the policies and procedures, uh, most people, when they come to that fence, when they hit that boundary and they realize that they're not in alignment with it, right. they will on their own go, oh, I'm not supposed to do that. And they make an adjustment and then they go from there. There are some who try to burrow under the fence and make up their own rules. Right. Um, and that's when we call in the wildlife department and haul them off. <laughs> well, I think all of this kind of goes back to I, what you just described with the contract for me would be managing expectations, managing customers' expectations. Exactly. And, and, and just, just uh, you had a disclaimer earlier. Just a disclaimer to people watching is, is that when you're trying to manage expectations, you don't say to the customer, I'm just trying to manage your expectations. That's not wise. I had somebody do that to me one time. It was like, no. Um, but, but really, what you, all of this comes back to communication, I think. Um, uh, uh, being able to, if you're, especially like when, in your situation as a, as a presenter, as a speaker, as a keynoter, uh, when somebody, um, when you, once you sign contracts, I'm sure there's, there's a tremendous amount of conversation that takes place, communication that takes place over what upfront as to what will and what will not happen. It's not just a matter of handing them a piece of paper and saying, here, sign this, uh, without right. really kind of reviewing with them. But there's a proactive communication involved in this where you're actually discussing what's going to occur 
uh, based on on the information that was in the, it, it, I feel like I'm kind of going off on it. I feel like the porcupine. I'm trying to get out from under the fence <laughs> right now. But I mean, I I, mm. it, I believe a lot of this has to do with just being open and honest in your communication with the people that you're working with. Would that be right. a assessment? Do you think? Well, yeah. Um, in I, I think this is fair to say in the majority of conflict. Right. The conflict exists because of a misunderstanding of expectations. Right. Um, let, me, let me say it this way. Uh, the expectations are either not clearly defined. Right. Or they have not been defined. Right. Or they were not understood. Correct. And if we were to just slow down and make sure, okay, here are the expectations. Um, uh, ask people what their expectations are because sometimes they, they just assume that we know what they want. Right. So I need them to define those expectations. And then if we're expressing our expectations, we need to ask some better questions to find out if they understood what those expectations are. Absolutely. You know, if you answer, if you ask a question that says, uh, do you understand my expectations? And they say, yes, they don't. And you don't know what they understood. Right. So asking better questions such as, so what part of, uh, the timeline is uh, uh, is acceptable to you. Um, is there anything specific about the timeline that concerns you? If they say yes, great, dig deeper. If they say no, then then you reiterate, okay, then I will be there at 3 in the afternoon and I'll be leaving at 2 p.m. or 2 a.m., whatever it might be. But you're just wanting to have that dialogue, and I, I think that's the value of really being clear about what our boundaries are. Absolutely. Um, actually, from your book, another quote, the best way to inspire others to improve performance is by giving them parameters up front and the permission to apply their potential within that context. In other words, uh, performance, parameters, permission, and potential. So the principle of the fence is that boundaries well-defined lead to greater possibilities. So um, moving on to the fourth section which is probably the most important part of all of this. And I'm surprised it's the fourth section, the starting line. I would think mm. the starting line would be the first thing we'd want to talk about. Why is the starting line so important in this, in this context of principles? Well, I left it for later in the book because I wanted to kind of set the stage and then come back to what I knew people would be curious about. And, and that's uh, how do you deal with how do you deal with problematic people, but hey, how do you deal with any personality at all? And uh, to me, it was addressing a, a mindset right. that most of us have been conditioned to believe uh, or, or even embraced ourselves, and that, uh, that has to do with that whole issue of respect. And what we've been conditioned to believe is that respect is something that is earned. If I have your respect, it's because I've done some things that have earned your respect, and the reverse right. is true. But what I believe, especially when there's times of misunderstanding and conflict, if we have the idea that people earn respect, uh, we've already put them on their heels. We've kind of pushed them in a position where they have to, they have to measure up in some way right. to, uh, to, be, um, to be respected. And I, I think that's a disadvantage for all of us. And so the principle that I wrote, and I, and I really do believe this, and it's a hard one to, to live because I think of our culture and our environments that force us in many ways to a different understanding. But here's the principle itself. Everyone deserves to be respected. It's not about earning it. It's just given right up front. Everyone deserves to be respected. And when I teach that, I have people say, well, Stephen, if, if people don't earn respect, what do they earn? And I wrote this in the book. Uh, they earn trust. If I start with respect and I treat you with respect, um, the, the, my tone of voice, my, my eye contact with you, the way I engage with you is going to be very different than what you are used to from everybody else because everybody else is treating you with a, well, you have to earn this. I'm going to give it to you right up front, and that's my baseline. Uh, trust is going to rise and it's going to fall based on the interactions we have with people. If somebody keeps their word, if they follow through, if they meet the expectation, uh, trust is going to be high. But if somebody lies to you, they don't follow through, they don't even show up, 
uh, that trust is going to drop. But I'm not going to allow my trust issues to become a dictator to me of how I respect. I'll still respect you, but I may change my boundaries. I may work differently with you in the future uh, because that's just wisdom. Uh, But I think that when we really see each other and we see other people as people that deserve to be respected, our interaction and their reactions are going to be much more positive. That's, that's got to be hard to do sometimes is to treat, I mean, let's be honest, as humans, that's got to be really, really hard to always treat everyone with respect. It's something that um, I, I certainly agree with, but I know that for a lot of folks that, that's really hard, mainly because I, I, believe, I believe that humans are naturally attraction, attracted to other humans who have their best interest and well-being at heart, which is pretty much the same as saying, respecting yes. these individuals. Um, yes. And, and the, the, the quickest way to build a, a loyal customer, customer base of raving fans is to just demonstrate that you care about them as humans. And so, yes. again, that's, that's adding on to that level of respect. If you go into a, uh, into a conversation, if you start at the starting line of a conversation with, with people thinking that you know more than what they know, um, then you're obviously, even if they came into the conversation with respect for you, they may, did that respect may, I won't say disappear completely, but would it be fair <laughs> to say that respect can also dissipate a little bit? I mean, chip away. At, at I think it can. I think it can. But you, you made a good point, and that is if we start with it. Right. And well, what does respect look like? Uh, respect looks like um, I, I ask questions because I'm interested in your story. Right. Uh, I listen to the things that you're saying that you're wanting to, to achieve. The, I, I, I care about the problems that maybe you have. Uh, I might not be the one that can solve the problem, but I'm going to listen to it. Absolutely. Uh, when we teach leadership classes, uh, this is the one thing that pops up the most is I ask, well, g- give me examples of how you can demonstrate respect. And every single time I ask that question, Everybody uh, responds with just taking time to stop telling my side of it and asking what's important to you and then listening. Right. I think um, uh, I, uh, I, I believe that listening is, again, I think this goes, but we, we've already kind of touched on it a few moments ago. I think that is the, the primary component of communication is just being able to, that, and that to me, is the, the greatest indication of respect is just being able to listen intently, being an active listener, not just a listener waiting for your opportunity to respond. So uh, the, the starting line principle is everyone deserves respect. So let's move on to, uh, there was like a bonus one in there, uh, which there had to do with, huh? <laughs> yeah, there was. There was a bonus one. And you really read the book because you found the bonus. I found the bonus, yes. There was no prize underneath the bonus, no. but I looked. I mean, I shook my iPad and there was nothing under it. But the, 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 the final uh, principle has to do with the finish line. Address that for me, if you would. Or the principle of success. Yeah. Um, the principle of the finish line, uh, I, I worked into the story because I had, uh, I had been trained, um, and, uh, I had become to believe what a lot of leaders in the past and leaders who've gone before us have taught. And that is that as you, as you rise in an organization, as you take on more leadership responsibilities, it gets lonely. Right. Um, you can't be friends with other people. You have to create some distance between yourselves. Yeah. You know, all of that stuff. And, and the, 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 um, the proverbial, it's lonely at the top. Right. And uh, as I look at it, um, I, I think if it's lonely at the top, you're doing it wrong. Um, you've got to find ways to help other people uh, develop, help them begin to uh, be more successful and, Really, your goal should be to to get to the finish line uh, with other people who care about the same outcomes. Right. And in the porcupine races, you can't win the race if you don't cross the line without with um, without your porcupine. You have to cross the line with your prickly person. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> you can't win just by going. Eh. 
Yeah, you know, you can't leave them at the starting line and run down and say, hey, I won. Uh, you got to come across the line as a team. And so I worked that as a bonus. And the, the principle, um, if I could share it with you, is just this. A shared success is always better than standing all alone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and that's, again, that comes back to it's, it's so hard sometimes for some people to realize it's not all about me. It's about us. Uh, one of my favorite quotes comes from uh, C. McNair Wilson, who wrote a book called Hatch, which has to do with creative brainstorming. But one of the quotes that I use often in my presentations is that um, we is always smarter than me. Mm -hmm. I, I love that quote just because I think it applies to so many things that even in my consulting work, I, I try really hard to, um, I, I, I want to make it a collaborative effort. Uh, I believe collaboration, um, create, especially creative collaboration can bring on wonderful possibilities that people never even thought were possible. Right. Um, so let's let's kind of wrap this up by kind of uh, by with a quick review of these these five principles because I think that they're all very important. And so for those of you that have been taking notes, if you want to catch up, the principle we the first principle is the principle of uh, well actually it's the principle of the starting line at the end of the book. Uh, yes. Everyone deserves to be respected, and then there is of course the principle of Burham: the best decisions come from timely, meaningful information and clarity of direction. The principle of the trash can, which I love that. Thoughtful conversations can help to achieve uh, positive solutions. Thoughtless confrontations will leave you running in circles, and I love that quote. The principle of the fence, which is boundaries well-defined lead to greater possibilities. Managing expectations, y'all. And then the principle of the finish line, the shared success is always better than standing alone. It's it. The greatest mm -hmm. successes are, are come from... Uh, from collaboration. Walt Disney once said, um, uh, you know, that, that it took a team to build Disneyland. It wasn't just one, you know, it may have been one man's vision, but it took a whole lot of right. people to make that come together. And that's one of the most successful places, uh, successful businesses ever. So, so Stephen, uh, show that copy of that book again okay. for everybody to see. It's called uh, The Porcupine Principles. By the way, did you bring Porky with you today? No, I did not. He I'm outside, sorry. He's probably outside uh, feeding or something. Yeah, well, um, he was taking some photos because he was having a little fun with the uh, the whole Starbucks thing about uh, pumpkin spice. Yeah. And so we, we did a little fun photo shoot with our, our porcupine and, and got him set up, and he's advertising that he's he's got your pumpkin spikes ready to go right now. <laughs> God, that is that's, yeah, that is just that's crazy. Sad. That's sad. <laughs> so how do how do uh, the people that are watching this wonderful show how do they get a copy of that wonderful book? Well, you can go to Amazon and you can order it directly and probably get it a lot quicker if you want. And uh, that's just uh, just look up the Porcupine Principles. Okay. Uh, Stephen Iverson, the author. Uh, you also see on Amazon a book that's now available and it's called the Por uh, Porcupine Philosophy. It has three hundred and sixty five leadership points. To ponder. <laughs> got to play with it. Just got to have some fun. <laughs> wow. Or you can go to my website uh, and it's www.stepheniverson.com and uh, you can go to the products page and order there. And if you want a signed copy, uh, that's the best place to make that happen. Awesome, Stephen. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. And I, and I really appreciate you sharing your, your knowledge and sharing the stories of, uh, of the porcupine principles. You said you competed uh, when you went in July, just real quick before we wrap. You, you said you competed last year? No, I, I didn't compete. I, I just went as an, as an observer. Oh, I, thought you know, you were I, I wanted to compete, but this year they didn't have enough porcupines uh, because of the weather and the rain. The porcupines uh, like to go a little further up in the mountains. They were hard to catch. So they had fewer contestants this year. So I didn't get the race. So we didn't hear, I didn't hear anything about the porcupine shortage. So that's, <laughs> well, there's not a shortage, but they were just hiding. Uh, okay. All right. Cool. <laughs> Well, again, Stephen, thank you so much. For those of you watching, thank you again for uh, being a part of Ron Roos Presents, uh, I, and I, I appreciate you hanging around. I will see you at the end of next month. Until then, see y'all.